Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we talk about the hard things. I'm Toby Dore. In today's episode, we'll experience the journey of overcoming childhood abandonment. Our guest today is Maura Dad, author of the international best-selling memoir, Cherishing Me, Letters to a Motherless Child. Maura is passionate about helping people make a deep, loving, and healing relationship with themselves to connect profoundly with their inner child. She also believes that through healing our own traumas, we help heal the trauma of humanity and the entire planet. Welcome, Maura. I'm so delighted to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you, Toby. You're welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. You're welcome. I'm glad to have you. You're my first international guest. So Maura lives in the UK and uh, she's joining us at at a big time difference. So I'm pretty excited about that. I like to ask all my guests a question that gives us a peek into who you are. What's your favorite color and what does that tell us about you? Uh, Yeah, this was a hard one, Toby, because (laughs) I just love all color. Mm -hmm. So I'm wearing this lovely green. I love the green, yes. Um, I feel that this represents nature. It's Easter Mm -hmm. time. It's new growth, new beginnings, new season. And this is like nature and, you know, all sorts of new growth and blossoming. And I love it. Good, good. I like green too. It is, and that's yeah. a beautiful green. There's so many shades of green, but that's a really no. happy, bright color. It's I great, mean, isn't it? And uh, because yes, I'm it passionate about growing and new beginnings and mm-hmm. fresh opportunities, I love it. <laughs> and that's definitely green for sure. <laughs> so, can you tell us about a crossroads in your life that pushed you in a different direction? Yes, I can. I can remember after the birth of my first son, so 42 years ago, Mm -hmm. um, I can remember having um, postnatal depression. Do you call it postpartum? Depression in America? I think we call it postpartum. Yeah, I think we do. Postpartum, yeah. And it it was pretty severe. So my mother had uh, killed herself with what we assume is the same. Mm -hmm. postpartum psychosis we think Mm -hmm. um and I remember feeling so bad I was standing in the kitchen in my home and I remember saying to myself I just don't want to follow my mother Mm -hmm. and do the same thing Mm -hmm. I am going to get some help I don't want to feel like this anymore and that was one of the biggest crossroads ever Mm -hmm. in my life it is a big step to reach out for help because yeah there's kind of a sometimes a stigma to it, like you feel you can't do it on your own and you should be able to. But I know I was in counseling for quite a while myself, and it really does help to reach out yes. and get that help that you need. And that's an important step. So I can relate Definitely. to that. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, briefly about your mother, but you know she did commit suicide when you were just an infant. And uh-huh. your father sent you to an orphanage for the first, was it six years of your life? Seven. Yeah. Seven. Okay. Those, those formative years, yeah, though. And your book is about the journey you've taken to move past those childhood wounds. Yeah. What was it like yeah. to be in an orphanage? I mean, most of us have no idea what happens in an orphanage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually had six foster homes, Toby, before oh, really? I got to the orphanage. Wow. I don't have any recollection of those at all. Mm. Six? Wow. Like, That's a lot. Yeah. Between 10 months old and three, like, why six foster homes? I have no idea. That's so interesting. I didn't realize that. And why didn't any one of them stick? I mean, what's so hard no. about a little baby? That's just strange. Oh, man. Yeah. So that didn't help Toby, I've just switched my light off here because I think it okay. was flickering. Okay. Um, I I have no idea at all why I was sent away and I had a sister who stayed with grandparents. I, mm-hmm. I, I'll never know the answer to that. But when I arrived in the orphanage, it was very clear that I had to conform. Mm. So it's a loveless institution. It's not a very nurturing environment with lots of hugs and kisses. Right. Nothing. Yeah. Absolutely zero. Lots of rules. 
um, wow. disobey the rules at your peril. Hmm. Um, rules are very strict. Uh, that almost yeah. sounds like a Charles Dickinson story. You know, you yeah. would think we've come uh, somewhere since then. I know. Well, wow. I'm old. I mean, it was. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, decades no, ago. I mean, you know, from the time it, it it sounds like something out of one of Charles Dickinson's stories, and those were written in the 1400s, and here we're in the 19th, you know, the 20th century, and they're still have these draconian orphanages. That just kind of blows my mind. I would think I that know. people would know how much that needs to change. So yeah. that had to be a really tough thing to overcome. And uh, a lot of your work is about healing the inner child. And so yeah. I can see, you know, where that took root. And you share so many experiences that have such correlation with some of my own experiences. You know, and I too have a wounded inner child. My inner child happened to be five years old when she was wounded. And so I'd like to talk more about those because I feel like I can really relate to those with you. One of the themes of my book is sharing that I found freedom behind bars when I realized that I had really created my own prison before I ever went to prison. And you talk about the realization that you'd built your own prison too. And how did that realization come to you and how did it free you once you saw that? Mm, that's a really good question. I pondered deeply on that question. <laughs> um, yes. Well, I think that it was in relationships more than mm -hmm. anything else. Uh, I began to realize that I was not emotionally mature, mm -hmm. that I took everything that people said personally. I was feeling rejected just all the time when there was no intention of rejection. I would find rejection mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that I was separating myself. I was isolating myself from the world, really. I mm -hmm. had a perfect mask on. I could smile. I could cope. I could be very independent. Nobody could see beyond my mask. Mm -hmm. Many people have told me that since. So Yes, I can so relate to that because, you know, I projected this perfect white picket fence life because I wanted to believe that that's what I had. And I would yeah. never let myself admit that it wasn't. And I think that's yeah. one thing that so blew everyone's minds when I, you know, committed the crime I did because it was so out of character. And yeah. I don't think we do ourselves a service by, you know, having a perfect life or pretending to have a perfect life or mm -hmm. you know, not admitting that there's something wrong and things that we need to fix. And I know that takes a tremendous amount of courage to yeah. recognize that. Um, you also share that you never gave yourself time to grieve. Well, you know, you lost your mother as an infant, and that's not a normal thing. Children should grieve for their parents. And I know, you know, I lost a baby just after her birth, and I never allowed myself to grieve that loss. I mean, in our family, mm -hmm. what we decided to do was never mention her name, never talk about it, just move on. And that was yeah. so detrimental. So yeah. how important to our emotional health do you think the grieving process is? Mm, gosh, yeah, I think it's essential. It's so essential. Um, do you do you do you know what I mean by a pressure cooker? Yes, I do. I do. Yes, yes. So you 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 put the food in the pan and you mm -hmm. put the lid on and you turn the heat up. Mm -hmm. And then when the pressure has built inside the pan, there's a little valve pops up, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't turn the heat down, eventually uh, there'll be a, a, a shooting up of steam, mm -hmm. taking all the food with it, mm -hmm. and you get food all over the ceiling. It makes a horrible mess. Yes. So that's my analogy of unexpressed grief. Yeah. Food painful emotion that's been pushed down and pushed down and pushed mm -hmm. down, not expressed, not expressed. Bearing in mind, nature provides us with tears and the ability yes. to express emotion. We're mm -hmm. created that way, aren't we? Yes. So when we're in the pressure cooker mode, it just feels terrible as that pressure mm -hmm. builds up. And well, I can only speak from my own experience, but working with lots and lots of clients with similar 
um, pressure cooker moments, mm -hmm. it can um, just explode. The feelings can explode in inappropriate ways mm -hmm. or, or it could be self-harming. Um, well, we can upset all the people in our family. It could be a million and one different things, mm -hmm. but it, it makes a mess. It's I, it certainly does, you know, and I think you can't acknowledge that grief by keeping it hidden and you have to acknowledge it and set it free in order for you to move past. Um, yes. And when you just continue to hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, then I kind of, in my particular situation, I found that I was in a situation where I was just desperate for some kind of change and yeah. it was an unhealthy change, but it seemed better than the place I was stuck in. And mm. I think if I had let that grief out and dealt with it and talked about it, that perhaps that would have never come to fruition in my life. So it really mm. is important to talk about grief. Absolutely. And and releasing it creates a space, a yes. new space. A space for love, a space for peace, a space for joy. Absolutely, yes. And the other thing, Toby, that I think is really important and often uh, overlooked is that um, uh, any kind of really painful emotion like that um, fills our body with survival energy, with cortisol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is acidic. It's corrosive. Mm -hmm. It's not good for us. It can make us ill. So we can make ourselves oh. very, very ill when we don't express. That's really things. interesting. I never thought about it from that area, that it's actually mm -hmm. physically unhealthy. Yes, it is. Wow, yeah. that's really interesting. You know, and you mm -hmm. talk about this huge secret black hole that you never acknowledged. And I had one, too. Mm -hmm. I think we all have them. And sure. those black holes are so dangerous because, you know, like mm -hmm. you said, they can affect you physically and, and affect yes. your health. I think they affect our decisions. I just think we aren't our best selves as long as we have some secret dark hole we're keeping from the world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so freeing. So what do you think is a good way to take the first step to at least acknowledge that you have some hidden dark hole that you need to release? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first acknowledgement has to be to ourself. Would you mm -hmm. agree? Yes, like absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we wake up? I don't right. know. I found yes. myself waking up mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing, well, like my crossroads moment, I explained, mm -hmm. I don't want to feel like this anymore. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to have the courage to ask for help. Asking for help is scary. It can't be as bad as the way I'm feeling now. Mm -hmm. That's so true. That's so true. And I think, you know, admitting to yourself that you have some secret dark hole that you're keeping from the world, that doesn't have to be something you're ashamed of. And it has to be something that you recognize that makes you human and that you and that there's something you need to discuss in order to become healthier. And so, you know, it really is healing to admit that you have that and start to begin the process Definitely. of letting it out. Yeah. 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 But, you know, when you say that, Toby, I don't mean but, and mm -hmm. when you say that, it, it makes me think that that's an adult conclusion. Yes, I think to. so, too. I think so, too. And our emotions come from our inner child, mm -hmm. from all those thoughts, feelings, perceptions that we we developed, we we. We program them into our yes. subconscious mm -hmm. brain when we're very young. And so that waking up to how we feel is very much, I feel, a part of um, allowing the adult to recognize that and being mm -hmm. able to step back and observe the child and for the adult to cultivate an attitude of loving acceptance towards the child. Mm -hmm. And for yes. the adult to say, uh, we need to go and get help, you and I. <laughs> yes, I so agree. You know, and I remember telling my therapist, you know, she said, what are you worried about? And I said, well, that I'm going to lose that five-year-old child because I love her and I don't want her to be lost. And she said, you aren't going to lose her. You're just going to love her. And you're going to yeah. tell her, you are five years old. You just be happy. I'll take care of this problem because this is an yeah. adult problem. It's not yours to solve. Yes. And, you know, I think that was so freeing to me because, you know, I realized I didn't have to let go of my inner child. I just had to embrace her in a healthy way and let her be a child. 
Yes. And not yes. try to save my adult life for me, which is what yeah. she was trying to do in very yeah. immature ways. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that was so interesting. And you yeah. mentioned that you realized that you were immersed in doing and not in being. And that that was an eye opener. And I can so relate to that. My entire life was a life of duty and a life of checklists. You know, if when I went to bed at night, if I couldn't check 17 things off my checklist for the day, it was a failed day in my mind. I don't know where I came up with 17, but that was my number. And that is, you know, I wasn't taking a bit of time to smell the roses along the way. Mm -hmm. I was just doing, doing, doing. And, yeah. and so how can you move from doing to being, how can you mm-hmm. realize that you're doing and not being what's the biggest mm-hmm. eye opener? Yeah, gosh, that's a big question, isn't it? It, mm-hmm. it comes back to this waking up, doesn't it? Yes, I think Actually so. Recognizing, oh gosh, what makes me do that? What makes mm-hmm. me have this tick list at the end of the day? Yeah. Um, I I feel very blessed that I discovered yoga. Uh, oh yeah, yoga is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And it's so great for slowing everything down. Mm-hmm. So I do believe that when we can quieten our mind, even just for five minutes, mm-hmm. just practicing breathing for five minutes, just anything at all, that is being. Well, mm-hmm. eat two minutes even, because five minutes is an eternity when you first yes. start. <laughs> when you first start, that's so true. Yeah. yeah. How yes. can I do my 17 things if I wasted five minutes, yes. you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's so true, that just to be aware and just to take a minute. You know, my husband and I have developed this habit, which I just love. And we decide, you know, we're just going to get in the car and go for a ride. And we Mm. drive for two or three hours and we never have a plan of where we're going. We just explore neighborhoods and towns. And during that whole time, we just talk about really deep things. And I can't do that in our house because, you know, there's the phone, there's email, there's things. But when you get in the car and you go somewhere, you're kind of locked in this capsule with your other half. And Yes. And, and you're not distracted by things around you. And so for me, that has become a really healthy way, I think, of just slowing down and just, you know, yes. learning. Yes, absolutely. I guess that could be very different for people on their own mm-hmm. and, um, or people, who, I don't know, who don't drive or, mm-hmm. you know, there could be other challenges, <laughs> I guess, to that. But I think there are always ways. If we make a decision, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I want to take care of myself more. Yes, I want to enjoy life mm-hmm. more. And you there know, are ways one of can discover yeah, that. One of the things I found when I didn't have a husband, and I, and this was when I was in prison, was journaling. And I found yes. that when I write with a pen. Yeah, And it's connected to my hand. I write from my heart. But when I type on the computer, I'm typing from my head. So Mm -hmm. I still think it's so important to just take a pen and just sit there and write whatever comes into your mind. And you will tell yourself the things you need to contemplate. They'll come out. So I think that's a great way to start being when you don't have someone to talk to. Yes, I I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Yeah. So you and said, that, course, oh, sorry. go ahead. No, I go was ahead. only going to say, Toby, that um, that was the basis for my book because yes. I'm writing letters uh-huh. uh, to my inner child. Yes, yeah. that's right. Your um, book is unique because it is a series of letters that you wrote to your inner child. And there's different letters yes. for different types of feelings so that yes. other people reading the book can take those same letters and use them. And I think yes. that was such a unique way to structure a book. I think that was pretty yes. interesting. Thank so, you. Yes. Now, so you have said that you are your own harshest critic. And of course, that's one of the things I can relate to, too. And I actually named my critic the shame dragon. And I pictured yeah. it as this dragon with these gnarly, dirty teeth and and big spiky tail. And when when I somebody said something that I felt I should be ashamed of that dragon slammed that tail into my chest and knocked me off my feet. And when I pictured it as this shame dragon, then I could picture myself drawing this sword and slaying the dragon. And so for me, having an image to fight kind of really helped me approach that critic. 
What mm-hmm. what method did you use to attack your yeah. harsh critic? <laughs> <laughs> you mean what method am I still using? Yes, yes, that's right. Because it's never over. My shame dragon's here now. You know, yeah. I, I just always yeah. know I, it's never a never ending task. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're all different, aren't we? Mm-hmm. We're we all are. unique. And I don't know why, but for me, when I used a visualization like that, mm-hmm. a monster type, mm-hmm. uh, you know, image, my inner critic got worse. Ah, oh, yeah. Isn't different things work for different people. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it, it kind of just came back with more of vengeance. Mm-hmm. So what I discovered over the years was um, setting boundaries for myself, mm-hmm. uh, feeling <laughs> that I was getting stronger in myself and able to challenge my own inner critic. Um, I had this image of a person, a, mm-hmm. a fairly faceless person, mm. but really like being horrible to me, you know, mm-hmm. like a slave driver. Mm-hmm. And I just kept saying no to them. No, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for taking care of me. I don't need you anymore. Uh-huh. And I imagine tussling with them sometimes. Uh-huh. But I'm I'm a superhero now. Mm-hmm. Uh, no no, no. I love <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I love good. the fact that yeah. you thank them for being in your life, but now you, now they could leave. You don't need them anymore. Yes. You know, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I think that's so interesting. And so one of the themes in your book is that the first few years of life are so critical and impactful to the person we become as an adult. And you suggested challenging those experiences. But how does one go back in time and try to rebuild negative childhood experiences? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seems so impossible, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It does. Mm-hmm. At times, it certainly does. Yeah, we truly can. Mm-hmm. Um, neuroplasticity, the experts call it, when uh, we can reprogram our brain. Mm-hmm. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. It certainly is. Mm-hmm. Um so the first thing is what we've talked about, uh, uh, waking up, mm-hmm. acknowledging mm-hmm. that there's something we want to change. I mean, we don't have to change. It's only if we want to. Right. Um, and I mean, if we're talking about connecting with the inner child in in the way that I do, you know, by talking to her and writing mm-hmm. her letters and mm-hmm. embracing her, there are many, many other ways, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's it's recognizing that it isn't her fault. Mm-hmm. So it's telling that child inside, it's not your fault. Oh, yeah, I think that's so critical. Yeah, you have, uh, talking to her or mm-hmm. him, mm-hmm. you have learned to become the way you are because of other people's expectations of mm-hmm. you, other people's opinions, other people's words. Um, you know, all your experiences have made, this is me talking to me, mm-hmm. uh, has made you conclude that you are bad, you are wrong, you are full of shame, you are unlovable. So that is, it sounds so easy to say that's mm-hmm. the first step, but it really is. Yeah, it is. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looking yeah, in I- the mirror is a good mm-hmm. one. Mm hmm. And, you know, we reprogram ourselves all the time. You know, we learn new tasks. I mean, you might learn to bake a dish you've never known how to make before. And you're reprogramming yourself to learn this new skill. Or if you decide to play an instrument, you have to learn Mm -hmm. how to do it. And there's every day we do things that we didn't think we could do before. So there's no reason to think that you can't go back and reprogram those negative childhood experiences and free yourself from the burden of carrying them around and just be Mm -hmm. able to let them go. I love that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. So Mm -hmm. you talk about fear of failure and fear of success. And those two seem exact opposites yet they often occur in the same person. Mm -hmm. So what do you recommend to listeners who want to face those fears? Yes. Well, I I feel on this that there may be two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not giving you a scientific uh, answer to this. It's from what I feel, but the 
fear of failure is is endemic. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. It comes from all those beliefs. Mm-hmm. I I can't do this. You know, I'll mm-hmm. never succeed. So that's usually about, uh, certainly in my life, it's about the anticipated or even assumed rejection and judgment mm-hmm. from the world around me. So if I mess up, well, it's my fault. And I'm full of shame and uh, yeah, I deserve to be rejected, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But also, if we think about the fear of success, that's also singling ourselves out mm-hmm. for judgment. Mm-hmm. And um, we don't want the judgment, but the fear is that we're going to get it because that's mm-hmm. what we're programmed with. Right. I'm going to be judged. <laughs> yeah. So the failure and the success, the opposite ends, aren't they, of the spectrum? Mm-hmm. But in a way, I think they're pretty much the same. I think they because, are because if you're afraid of success about something, I think one of the reasons is because you're afraid now they're going to expect me to do something even bigger and I'm not going to yes. be able to. And so yeah. really it is tied <laughs> yes. to that fear of failure. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a fragile place, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It certainly is. It certainly yeah. is. And and there are so many ways to measure success. And you know, a lot of times my idea of success on some particular project will be totally different than my husband's idea of success. Yes. And one of yes. us may not even come close to what our idea mm-hmm. was, but that doesn't mean there wasn't success in there. I think maybe what we need to do is to celebrate success at any level and, and yes. celebrate even steps forward, even if that's just on our journey to uh, some final destination. And oh, and not yes. set ourselves things that are just almost unattainable. You know, just yes. be happy with moving forward. Yes. Oh gosh, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. that. It's, One of your. Oh, go ahead. I was only going to say it's it's not just success in doing things, is it? Back mm-hmm. to doing and being. It's mm-hmm. success about being being who I am. Yes, that's so but, true. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that as you finished mm-hmm. up there. That's yeah. so true. Yeah. Because, you know, I believe, I tell people all this all the time. I mean, I can write a memoir. You can write a memoir. But our memoirs are so different. I wrote mm-hmm. a memoir about rebuilding my life while I was in prison. And then some other woman could write a memoir about rebuilding her life in prison. And it would be similar to mine. But her book might reach someone that my book didn't reach. Which yes. is why I think it's so important for all of us to tell our stories because oh, there's someone yes. out there that our particular story is mm. tailored to reach. And if we decide not to tell our stories because it's already been told by somebody else, we won't reach that person who is just waiting to hear from us. Mm-hmm. Isn't so that I think, wonderful? Yes, it that's, is. That's it is. Awesome. And there's no limit to the amount of books the world can hold. So yes. I love that. So yes. one of your topic, topics is titled, I am enough. And that really drove home to me because when I was in counseling, my therapist asked me once, what would you tell that five-year-old child? And I, my immediate answer without thinking was, I would tell her, you are enough. And so for yeah. a long time, that was one of my theme messages. And I think I am enough. It doesn't mean that you can't learn and grow and be more, but it means you are enough. You are accepted just as you are. And I think yeah. that is such a worthy and valuable message. And um, how did you come to that thought? And and how did you mm-hmm. approach it? I think I approached it, Toby, through recognizing that my childhood traumas had given me a sense of needing to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Perfectionism. Mm-hmm. That's one of my vices too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and of course, we, we know this. We can say it easily enough. Oh, there's no such thing as perfect. Most mm-hmm. people say that. Oh, there's no mm-hmm. such thing as perfect. As if we accept any less. Mm-hmm. Um, what I found, though, with my inner critic is that I would always move the goalposts. Oh, so yes. I would never be good enough. You Whatever could never I did, attain that. Yeah. Never attain mm-hmm. it. I would mm-hmm. always, yeah, well, when I do this, I'll, I'll be okay. When I do that, et cetera, right. et cetera. Et cetera. Right. So for me, it was accepting, mm-hmm. deeply accepting that who I am is good enough. Uh, of course, I'm not perfect. And what does that mean anyway? I'm mm-hmm. good enough for me. <laughs> right, right. That's right. I think that's so important. 
And I think when we recognize that, we give ourselves permission to be and to stop doing. So, which yes. is, you know, one of the big objectives, I think, in bringing joy into your life. I Absolutely. love that. Yes. I, uh, I went to a women's retreat once and they put, they had these little cabins and you'd go in each cabin and there was a word in that cabin and you were to sit there and reflect on that word, you know, and we moved around. And when I got to this one cabin and the word joy was on the wall. And when I sat there and looked at the word joy, I just started sobbing because I realized I had spent my whole life blocking joy because I never thought I deserved it. Yeah. And, and so now, you know, I try to find joy and I still struggle with believing that I deserve to be joyful, but you know, it's such a, it's made such an imprint on my mind. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. when we let go of this perfectionism and we tell ourselves we're enough, then there's room for joy to come in. And yes. I, I think that's what builds our souls. So mm -hmm. I love yes. that. I, I believe to be that joy comes from our deepest, deepest inner child, mm -hmm. like our, our soulful self, the innocence mm -hmm. yes. of, of that newborn infant. Mm -hmm. And when she or he gets her emotional needs met, joy naturally flows. Yes, yes. It's when we get covered up with all sorts of negativity. Mm -hmm. That's when the joy gets stuck. Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, you know, so joy has, I still don't think I'm to the point where I just automatically let it in and embrace it, but at least I'm aware of it and I look for it. Yes. So yes. I think that's yes. an important word. I know you really had to sit down and rip into so many facets of your life and your emotions. How hard was it for you to write about those? And how long did it take you to finish the book? Mm. It took me about six months. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It was fairly quick, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked with um, a writing coach. So mm -hmm. I kind of wrote the book and then had to do lots of editing. Yes, yes, to yes. Uh -huh. Polish it. Um, it. I think by the time I got to the stage of writing the book, it wasn't like it was a new raw pain. Mm -hmm. um, I was familiar with, with my pain. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, of course, it was painful because I oh, yeah. revisited all of it all in mm -hmm. one go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I can relate. Um, you know, I worked on my book for about 15 years. And really, I say oh, I was wow. just muddling pages around because... I didn't know where to start. I just knew I was going to write a book, but I had no idea what it was going to be. And so when you read my first versions of my book, it was kind of like reading a patient's chart in a hospital. You know, it was just a bunch of facts. There was no emotion. There was no yeah. insight. It was just lists of things that happened. But once I figured out where the book was going to start and where the book was going to end, which came with my writing coach, it took me like five months to write it. So yeah. I really think that, yeah. you know, it just comes. And I know sometimes, you know, yeah. my husband would say to me, where are you today? And I'd say, oh, gosh, I'm on suicide watch in prison. He said, oh, that's a bad place to be. Uh, you know, I'll be glad when you move on from that place, you know, because no, when you're no. reading it or yes. you're writing it, you're put yourself right back there. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I found, yes. you know, it's a very healing process. Did you find it that way to write your book? I did. So be mm. very healing, very cathartic. Yes. And there was something about the orderliness of it. It was my entire life. There was something yes. very, very contained and helpful about that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't scattered. It was, it yes. was all there, all yes. in one place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. So yeah. what's one question you wish I'd ask? Is there something you'd like to add that we haven't talked about? Oh, wow. Um, well, I guess I think you touched on it earlier. Um, um, what, what, what possible gifts mm. could I have gained from a childhood such as mine? From oh, yes. I love that. Uh, growing then, up without mm -hmm. a mother and a father, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. growing up um, almost like an orphan, not quite. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, uh, I think that's my question. I love that question. So how would you have answered that? What yes. gifts <laughs> did you gain from your childhood? Well, gosh, I mean, of course, it's still painful. Mm -hmm. Never, ever to have known the love of a mother. I know, of course, not everybody mm -hmm. has a loving mother. I know mm -hmm. that. Um, but in a fantasy, what I call a Disney type mm -hmm. sense, I imagine what it might have been like. And of course, I will never know that. What it's given me is a profound empathy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. understanding of other people's pain and loss mm -hmm. and, and trauma. I, I, I mean, I just get it. There's very little that I mm -hmm. can't come alongside another person with. And I think I, yeah. I was trying to validating. That is yeah. really an important skill. And you know, I found, I think it's when we're in the darkest places that we have the opportunity for the most growth. Because yes. if everything's beautiful, there's no need for anything to change. We just kind of yeah. stayed on through. So I kind of look at some of the darkest places in my life almost as blessings because they gave yes. me strength and courage and yes. uh, yep. resilience. Definitely. So, yeah, I love that yes. question. That's a great question. I'm glad you brought yes. that up. I love oh, that. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Maura, for being on my podcast. I'm so delighted to have you here. And um, I'm going to wrap things up. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Remember, none of us is our worst mistake. We all have so much more to offer the world. And those so-called mistakes are blessed opportunities to learn and grow. Next week, we'll continue to bring you inspiring stories by people who've identified a need for change and are working to make a difference in the world. Subscribe to our Patreon channel, Fierce Conversations, for special access and behind-the-scenes info. Go to patreon.com slash fierce conversations or click on the link in the show notes. 10% of the Patreon proceeds is used to provide workbooks to women in prison. The show notes will also provide a link to purchase my book, Living with Conviction, and a link to Maura's book. In my memoir, Living with Conviction, I recount a conversation I had in prison where my friend Lisa told me, in here, we can talk about all the hard things. In fact, I think we must. And so we shall. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby. Until next time.